Hi, global friends. Welcome to Round the World. My name is Colin McDougall, and I am creating this series uh, currently. Um, I am typically on the other side of the camera, uh, so you probably don't know who I am, uh, but I'm a producer with the Producers Guild of America and have produced content for a plethora of production companies and studios here in Los Angeles and also around the world. I made a solemn vow that I never really wanted to be on this side of the camera, uh, but during this global pandemic times, I decided to seriously consider all of the promises I've made myself. Um, so here we are. Uh, I just recently woke up about two weeks ago from a surgery that was to correct a bunch of child abuse that I went through as a kid. Uh, and upon waking up, realized that the COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic was a global issue. Uh, I spent half of my year here in Los Angeles and the other half in Venice, Italy. Can't see it right now, but it's over there. Um, and I have been talking to my friends and family there and realized that there's so much disconnect from people not knowing what's going on around the world other than what they're seeing on the news. So I wanted to take the time to call friends and friends of friends uh, around the world to see what real people in real places are going through during this incredibly real uh, global pandemic. So let's head back to my house just over there <laughs> and grab some Wi-Fi so that we can see who we can get on. I'll see you guys soon. I would like to go back to what I said in the beginning uh, in that, um, you know, I woke up from a surgery and COVID-19 had hit America in a very strong and different way than it had before. Uh, and so dealing with that was uh, very strange, uh, waking up in what is pretty much a, a Black Mirror episode. Um, and the only thing that I could possibly think to do was to call people that I know across the world. Um, I live a very charmed life now. Uh, that's something that I'm realizing through this entire global pandemic. Uh, I'm a very, very fortunate person. It wasn't always like that. Um, I have been, I've struggled with homelessness uh, multiple times in life. I was kicked out of my home pretty much uh, at 15 and uh, was told because of my sexuality that I uh, couldn't be a part of a certain side of my family. Um, so truly realizing the family that I've created uh, around the globe, family and friends, friends also equal family to me, uh, has been remarkable and eye-opening and I hope that this helps all of you out there realize that you are not alone. Um, and with that, I would like to call a very great friend of mine who I've known since she was in middle school. Um, she was my little sister Marlena's best friend growing up um, and used to braid her hair. <laughs> uh, and she ended up becoming Miss America uh, and you know, has done so much uh, for advocacy groups. Uh, she even ran uh, for Congress last year. Uh, hopefully won't be the last time you see such a brilliant mind and voice uh, out there in the political sector. Um, but yeah, let's give Mallory Hagen uh, a call and see what things are like back in my hometown of Opelika, Alabama. Hi, I'm Mallory Hagen. I was Miss America back in 2013. I have known Colin since as long as I can remember, um, and I'm quarantined. Like the rest of us. <laughs> like the rest of us. Um, okay, cool. So can you please tell us where you are currently? So currently I am in the Auburn of Alika area in Alabama, and um chilling at home. This quarantine has not in our country yet become a martial law situation. And so there are a lot of people that aren't practicing, you know, social distancing. Uh, there are a lot of uh, employment agencies that are not uh, seen as essential in some states, uh, but are still going to work. Uh, and so, you know, this is something that 
over our entire giant country is being navigated in completely different ways. Yeah, navigating the waters of um, doing your part, I think, has been obviously an interesting, it's not an experiment by any stretch of the imagination, but if you want to look at it that way, it's been a really interesting social experiment to see who really understands their role in society and how their day-to-day interactions can actually impact you know, not tens, but hundreds of people um, throughout the day. And uh, people are out and about and shopping and, um, you know, most of the stores are still open. So uh, that's a little disheartening considering, you know, our medical system is a bit overwhelmed in the state of Alabama as is, not to mention adding this layer on top of it. So um, hopefully we'll do something about that here soon. (laughs) There's a lot of media going out around social media and also on the news showing lines that go for miles around stores, uh, especially in small towns. Uh, So what is the shopping situation like currently in, in Alabama? I have yet to see any situation that was like lines around stores. Um, I have heard that a few of our stores have had that sort of in their opening hours uh, over the last couple of days. But um, I actually took this seriously when the conversation started. Interestingly enough, I'm surprised. I'm actually surprised that I did because usually I'm not an alarmist and I I'm, think I'm pretty pragmatic. But um, I sort of heard that this was coming and I started stocking up like little by little. And so I didn't need to go to the store and do a big haul or anything like that. Um, I just sort of started stocking my freezer and things of that nature. But uh, all that to say, the stores that I do frequent, which are a few, um, the shelves, you know, have restrictions placed on how many per item you can buy. Um, and many of the like the meat freezers are empty, um, you know, paper towel rolls empty, things like that. So I've seen a little bit of that here and there. It's been a little apocalyptic feeling here uh, in certain areas of the grocery store. And then, of course, like produce looks normal as usual. <laughs> yeah, people aren't eating enough fruits and veggies. They're not, they're not, but you know, they don't keep and I understand that. A lot of people are seen in Alabama as the stereotype of, uh, you know, a redneck or lower income. How do you think that this specific, um, you know, global pandemic is going to affect people that are less economically stable? So I I think in a place like Alabama, we're going to see a lasting impact from, um, you know, this entire pandemic for years, if we don't flatten the curve here soon. Um, You know, so much of our small towns, so much of our rural areas are dependent on uh, small businesses, uh, family owned businesses. And essentially, everyone at this time is having a hard time figuring out how they're going to pay their rent for the next month, much less keep people employed. Business owners are coming up with creative and out of the box ways to keep their business running. I've seen that through much of social media, trying to keep in contact with those small business owners here. But I do think, especially in our rural areas, um, you know, our state is already so economically depressed and uh, this, this could be um, sort of one of those final straws that forces families to move elsewhere because after this is over, will there be opportunity to earn income? It's unclear. What do you think is currently going on like globally and also in Alabama uh, with COVID right now? I know that we're uh, trying really hard to pass legislation that allows for relief. Um, What I hope that we're coming to is an agreement that it's the everyday working American that needs relief and not our major corporations. Um, We've seen in the past that that doesn't necessarily trickle down to the everyday American. And and this is a scenario where we cannot uh, bank on business owners and corporations doing the right thing. We need to be able to put uh, money and um, relief in the hands of people who really need it. And so I'm I'm hopeful that that's what's going on. Uh, I'm also hopeful that more people are, are understanding that the sooner they stay home and the sooner they distance themselves, the sooner this all goes away. That actually brings up a very good point uh, in that there's been a lot of social media coverage and also news coverage regarding these thousand dollar checks that supposedly the administration is putting together as relief. Uh, do you see that being a realization? I hope that this relief package that could potentially put a thousand or fifteen hundred dollars in the hands of everyday Americans comes to fruition. I think it is a possibility. It is going to be very difficult to um, get from point A to point B just with the bureaucracy that we see across the country and and any one of our government agencies or any agency really. Um, So I'm hopeful, but I uh, I also think that what we need to be looking at is 
relief by way of mortgage forgiveness. Um, I, I'm sure you know and saw that Italy uh, made it such that people didn't have to pay their rent or mortgage for a certain time frame. And I think that in order for any of us to survive this, that's really going to be the key. Ultimately, everything is about paying for the roof over your head. So if all mortgages are forgiven, then everyone can kind of sort of come back to the plate with a clean slate. What do you think is going to be the biggest backlash of COVID-19 in Alabama and also the world? I don't know if this would be considered backlash so much as I hope it's a realization that um, our healthcare system does not work for everyone. It doesn't even work for the people who have health care. And what we're seeing here is a huge um Obviously, we've seen the shortages across the country of just materials and supplies, but also the fact that there are so many Americans who don't understand that um, in this very moment, if they are sick, first and foremost, it is to take care of that sickness so that it doesn't spread. And so many Americans are without insurance um, or underinsured and therefore scared to go to the doctor, scared of those bills that are gonna come in. And so um, what I hope is that this wakes many people up to the fact that in America, Medicare for all might not be the solution, but we do need to do something to further ensure Americans and make sure that people are prepared for situations like this, because ultimately our economy can't thrive if we don't have people to work in any of our businesses. And so healthcare really is the root of so many of our issues in our country. And um, I I hope people wake up to that that fact. The globalization of this specific disease just shows how, you know, open communication between countries, like nationalism isn't really a thing anymore to the extent of as it used to be. I mean, like we used to be tribes and then we, uh, you know, became cities. And then so like now we have to, as a people, realize that we are not just citizens of the United States. We are also citizens of the world. I, I think that it's it is incredibly humbling to many people in America who didn't quite realize that we were a part of a global community until they realized, hey, wait, every single person on the planet, literally everyone, no matter where they live or their socioeconomic status or any of those things, none of that matters because everyone is in the same boat right now. And so I do think that this um, this time frame is, a, <laughs> I, I'm sure you've seen the memes that are like, this is mother nature telling us to go to our rooms and think about what we've done. But I really genuinely hope that this is a time for people to reflect on the fact that uh, just because you were born on a certain plot of land in a certain space on the globe does not make you immune to the world's problems. And it also doesn't make you better than anyone else. At the end of the day, everyone is dealing with the same issues. And so I, I hope that this is a time to reflect and potentially be humbled by that. That is massively well said. Like that could have won you Miss America again. <laughs> Uh, What is one downfall that you've noticed um, within your area or globally, whichever you choose, um, during this global pandemic? My sleep schedule is absolutely just out of whack. Uh, And so I think that one of the downfalls is sort of this, this has a potential to put people in depressive episodes, which can be hard to climb out of, even if the world tomorrow says you're fine, go back out into the universe. Well, after so many days of sort of no routine and and, um, nothing to do, it can be hard to put yourself back into a routine. So going back to the workforce or going back to those day-to-day activities that people normally do can can be difficult. And so I think that we'll see the ramifications of that when this um, all comes to an end, if and when it does. How long are we going to be doing this? It's still unclear. (laughs) Um, But I I do worry about that a little bit. I worry that if we start getting into a place where we have a shortage of um, commodities that we'll see, you know, the worst in society in some of those ways. Um, What I've seen here in town, though, is a lot of people trying to come together to find solutions. So my hope is that when we do, if we do run out of a certain commodity, that we figure out a way as a community to sort of trade and barter or or just be communal versus um you know fighting or looting or anything like that but uh, those are those are worries that i that i have that could become an issue if this goes on for too long 
can you tell me a triumph that you've personally experienced or saw online or something that just makes you so happy? Well, as someone who worked in the restaurant industry for a really long time, and I worked in the restaurant industry in New York City, paying my bills, uh, you know, very expensive bills through uh, the many places I worked, I I've seen so many restaurant groups that have been forced to close their doors. Um, you know, put money into a GoFundMe and then also accepting uh, donations to disperse equally to their employees and their staff. And that to me is heartwarming to see that these these employers and these larger restaurant groups are really trying hard to take care of their own in this time when they can't provide them a place to work and they've had to close their doors. So um, I think things like that, you know, people people being willing to buy gift cards to a small business in this time to use later so that they can stay afloat, of course, through this time frame. Please do, uh, like, go out there and research ways to help uh, local businesses in your neighborhood. If every single person helps a local business in their neighborhood, uh, then this will be a whole other type of amazingness that we can look back on and be proud of. We, we were joking earlier about just the... the the beauty of technology, but truly in this time, like Venmo, Cash App, PayPal, I mean, all of these different services to be able to send $5 to your friend or your barista, the person you normally get your coffee from, you know, all of those people are suffering. So uh, I haven't had any of my regular coffee every day like I normally do. So instead, I'm trying to send that four or five dollars that I would normally spend to someone who I know works in the restaurant industry. And I think if people do those small things, the small dollars that you normally spend, if you send them to somebody who could really need them, it'll add up eventually. I love that idea. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, so is there anything specific that you would like to tell your local community and then also globally to the people watching this? I think the thing that I would most like to say is that if you're feeling alone or um, isolated, that we do have so many different ways to connect with each other. And I know that typing on Facebook or social media is not necessarily it. So um, don't be afraid during this time to reach out and say, I just need to sit with someone. There are places you can go and things you can do where you minimize risk, but can also interact with someone face to face. For instance, I went to the park the other day and just walked around. I didn't congregate with anyone, but it was nice to see other pieces of humanity and uh, to get some fresh air. So I, I would say to, to really take your mental health and this time frame of isolation seriously. And if you need help, to not be afraid to reach out and ask for it. Our whole world literally depends on all of us being uh, in a mental space yeah. to take it on when this is all over. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, I mean, that's a global message, no matter where you live, I think that's really important. And then here locally, I just, I really, really, really want our local uh, people to take this seriously. You know, I have a grandfather who works in one of our um, grocery stores. He, he still has to go to work even though he's at the age range that's at risk. And so by you staying home, you are, are taking care of other people. You're taking care of your community. And it's really important that you do that. Um, so please do. I love you very much. And you taking this time out of your day, even if you are sitting at home, means the world to me. Uh, so thanks so much. No, thanks for having me, and thanks for doing this. I'm sure so many people are going to learn a lot from these, and um, way to make the best of some time at home, you know? Thanks, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. I spend half of my year here in Los Angeles, and the other half in Venice, Italy. Um, my partner and his family are from a small part of Venice uh, called Lido di Yesolo, and... So I've been talking to them almost every single day uh, during this entire situation, just finding out exactly what they're going through in Italy. Uh, it's a highly publicized area in the globe right now uh, due to COVID-19. And I wanted to actually talk to someone on the ground in Italy. So let's call a friend of mine that I met at the Venice Film Festival and see what he's up to. My name is Roberto. I live in the Veneto region in northern eastern Italy, um, and I work for an entertainment company. Uh, and I'm currently in the small town of Limena, a lovely little place, a lovely little town um, 25 miles um, away from Venice. Can you tell me what the level of quarantine is in Limena? What are you currently going through? 
well, we're basically in a national lockdown. Uh, we're stuck at home for days. We can only go out for groceries and pharmacy to pharmacies uh, unless we have one of those essential jobs. What are they currently deeming as essential? To go to the supermarket and, of course, buy groceries, to go to pharmacies and buy um, drugs and um, pharmaceutical uh, items and of course going to hospitals if someone has a uh, medical appointments and um, people at work in the uh, essential jobs for in uh, factories and um, other workplaces that are part of that uh, production that is needed by everyone have you left your house? Because I was told that you have to, like, only one person from your family is allowed to go. We are only going out to to go to supermarket, and you will probably find long lines uh, because only one person is allowed, uh, one per family, and very few people each time are let into the supermarket so as not to create large crowds into it. Um, and there's controls and checks. What were your thoughts when COVID-19 started to spread? As news started coming out of China in the first few weeks, I, I did realize that it could be this could be the big one. Uh, so, but it didn't really strike me as uh, as a global pandemic until. It started appearing in Europe as well, especially in my country, which was the first European country to have a massive outbreak. And at that point, um, at first, I I was very uh, afraid, uh, especially because one of, one of the first few cases appeared near the place where I live. Um, so there was a, I was a little bit disturbed, especially because we don't know much about this virus. So uh, there's always a, a little bit of tension when you talk about it. Now, I happen to know that your media and cable is owned by your government and you pay it through taxes. And so a lot of the media was taken over by this. And in, in my opinion, you know, that was part of the reason why it was so scary and is still so scary is that people are just seeing themselves as numbers. Um, so can you just talk about kind of like what it's like to be in Italy and, you know, everyone's just watching the news and the evolution of information and things like that? They, they, they helped create this um, sort of paranoid um, state of mind where people really cannot get a break from the pandemic. So, um, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty serious, but now news are starting to be more, I wouldn't say optimistic, but at least they're starting to shift the focus on positive news as well. Oh, great. Oh, so, that's so that, yeah. amazing to hear. Yesterday, there, there's been a decline in uh, new cases, um, positive cases and deaths and hospitalizations. So uh, at almost two weeks from the start of the quarantine, the national lockdown, we're starting to see some glimmer of, glimmer of hope. This is a global effort. This is not just about Italy or France or the United States or Spain. We're all trying to um, contain something that is um, is almost out of control, but we have to do it for the sake of everyone, for the sake of uh, the health of people, for the sake of the economy, for the sake of society in general. If you if you roll, if you if we are going to survive this as a planet as um, as a global community, we have to think of other people first before ourselves. What do you think the biggest backlash of COVID-19 is going to be for Italy? Uh, the economy is going uh, is going to be severely hit after this. And we were all we were already coming out of a a tough recession. Uh, so it, we're pretty much jumping back into it. When we go out and when we go to the supermarket or pharmacy, there's this general sense of suspicion around us that is not going to be easy 
to get rid of uh, in the near future because, of course, you never know how you can catch this virus. So we're always standing. It's not just about physical distance. It's emotional distance as well. We're missing the physical contact. We're missing the hugs and the handshakes and the kisses, you know. Um, but it's too deep-seated into our uh, culture to let that go because of a virus. So when the situation, when we overcome this pandemic, um, I think that's going to be strengthened rather than weakened by all this. So we're going to hug each other and we're going to kiss each other with much more passion because we missed it. What is one downfall or bad thing that you've noticed through this pandemic? Uh, of course, the uh, just the sheer number of deaths that has happened, that's happening in Lombardy and in Veneto and Emilia Romagna. Uh, they um, graveyards and cemeteries cannot accommodate everyone. Uh, so um, institutions are turning to crematoriums as well. Now, of course, that's a, that's a very scary thought. Um, and there's no um, funerals either, because that, that that would mean crowds, and that and that would mean do- dozens of funerals every day, which cannot happen. So, um, especially in Italy, which is a very Catholic and very religious country, that's almost felt as a sacrilege of some sort. There is a there is a lot of suffering, and I, it's really too much. Um, I'm, I'm I'm a very sensitive guy, and reading the story, there's so many stories on uh, not just. Uh, the um, national newspapers, but on local editions and local newspapers, there's tons of stories that you won't hear about that are just uh, heartbreaking. Uh, um, and since I live far away from my parents, because they live down south, uh, there's, um, I thought about it a couple of nights ago, um, when after you, um, you wrote to me, um, I... Uh, it's, it's very it's very hard to say it, but there's this latent feeling in me that I might not be able to see my parents again. I'm so sorry. I I hope that that's not the case. I'm like tearing up over here. I don't know how I'm still able to to fall asleep at night, but uh, my my parents are very are doing very well, and they um, they're just going out once a week for groceries, and that's it. Okay. Good, good, good. I, I think they're going to be okay. And I, okay. Uh, I'm i going to put some good thoughts in the universe for you. What is one good thing or triumph that you've seen through the Italian community so far during this pandemic? Uh, the Italian population, the Italian people reacted in a surprising, surprisingly positive way to the uh, very strict measures imposed by the government. You know, there's a lot of saying, especially here, we're very self-critical, um, especially here, that, you know, Italians just don't follow the rules. They just don't care about them. But in reality, um, there's a lot of people who, have take, who are taking very a lot of care about this. Uh, they don't go out. They, uh, they just stay at home. Um, it's just a, a very good sign for the future because... It's always been said um, that we always have an ace up our sleeves, you know, we as a, as a people. Uh, and it's definitely true. When, when push comes to shove, you know, when the chips are down, we can react all together. And that's very nice to see. And is there anything specific in closing that you would like to say specifically in Italian to other Italians just about what they should be focusing on and things of that nature? Voglio dire solo che tutti insieme ce la faremo eh, aiutando la gente che lavora negli ospedali, nelle ambulanze, nei pronti soccorsi. Eh, dobbiamo fare solo la nostra parte. And is there anything that you would like to say in English to, you know, countries far away, letting them know how Italy is doing and, and where Italy's heart currently is? 
Well, to all the countries who are about to experience, who are experiencing the same uh, situation as we are here in Italy, I just want to say that it it's um, it takes some getting used to the um, attention um, that is brought by this uh, pan- pandemic. But you'll soon realize that this effort is worth it. Um, and that it's nothing uh, it's nothing that we cannot do um, a lockdown we can we can endure it uh, because we know and you know that you are doing it for the, the health and for the good of weaker people because a, a society the strength of a society is defined by how we support those who are um, less fortunate Thank you so much for your time, Roberto. I appreciate you, uh, you know, taking this time to get on with me. Uh, it's super early in the morning here, and I hope it is a beautiful day for the rest of the day for you guys. Thank you so much, Colin, for for the time that you've uh, given me. I wanted to check in with an amazing human being who I worked with on a reality television show that I'm sure you've probably all seen. So let's check in with her and the land down under. So hi guys, I'm Hannah Ferrier and I work in reality TV. I am currently in Sydney, Australia. Can you tell me a little bit about what the level of quarantine is currently in Sydney? We have our pubs, bars, restaurants, etc. shut down. They're basically politely asking us not to leave the house, but there's nothing strict in place. So I know I've got a lot of friends around the world, so we're a lot better off than most. We can still walk outside and exercise, walk the dog, um, but everyone is kind of, well, most people are erring on the side of caution. Um, but then, you know, in saying that on Friday, we had the largest day this year in Australia down at Bondi Beach and another hundred people were infected down there on that one day. So some people are not listening and spreading it further. I think a lot of people are going, I'm young, it's just like a flu, I'll get over it. And they aren't realizing like it's not about you. But I think we live in quite a selfish time in the world as well. And we kind of are, everyone's just very concerned about themselves. And these people aren't realizing that You might have it, you might not even have any symptoms, but then you're passing it on to someone who goes to see their grandmother and their grandmother gets it, has a respiratory issue and passes away. And that is you not self-isolating. In terms of the media, the media is in this situation where it's almost like the little boy who called wolf because I feel like they constantly over-dramatize things And I don't think they are this time, but I think people think they are when they're actually not. What were your thoughts when you first heard about COVID-19? When I first heard about it, I kind of just thought it would be like another flu-like thing that kind of just went on its merry way, to be honest, but obviously not. Uh, My thoughts are really different now um, in terms of what's going to happen moving forward with coronavirus. Actually, I was on Twitter today and I saw someone uh, had tweeted, oh, this will all be over within the week. And it's like... I just, how can you still be thinking like that, you know? What is the testing situation like in Sydney at the moment? We definitely don't have adequate testing in Sydney. Um, Like my father was, he works in government and somebody um, at his work came back positive. So I know that they're putting in, you know, they're making sure that the people have symptoms and signs and things like that before they're tested. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's, in government so I don't even know how hard it would be for you know a regular Joe to walk off the street and get tested what do you think is the most significant way that you've personally been affected through this uh, pandemic a lot of my work is in America so I was supposed to be in LA right now and Mm -hmm. I've basically been locked down not only to Sydney but to my house and um, you know, I'm very lucky because my partner's work is secure. Uh, yeah, but yeah. it's just scary speaking to people, you know, because a lot of people live week to week. And, Absolutely. you know, I've got obviously a lot of friends in hospitality and it's scary because they have like a month rent and nobody really knows when the jobs are going to come back. Maybe. In America, they're having talks on suspending rents and mortgages for a specific amount of time. Is that something that's going on in Sydney as well? 
So we've had, the sad thing is though, is they've actually increased what we call the doll, so it's welfare. Um, they've nearly doubled that. So then a lot of people have actually quit their jobs to go onto that because they're getting more money that oh. way. So I don't know if that's going to be a bit of a backlash. And they're also letting um, people access their superannuation early, which is fantastic for now, but superannuation's there for a reason. So I don't know if it's going to be fantastic when these people retire in 30 years' time and they have you know, significantly less superannuation than they would have. In Australia specifically, it's going to be very difficult because obviously we have a massive tourism trade as does America and Europe. But I think just the uncertainty of what's happened and when it's going to end, you know. And I feel like, honestly, it's very difficult for Australia because we just went through this. We just had the bushfires, you know. Yeah. Our entire summer yeah. was written off, basically. And so I feel like we just came through a massive tragedy. It was They were the largest bushfires in so many years. We lost so many lives and... So many farmers, you know, lost their crops and everything. So it's almost like this double whammy because we don't actually have, like, a lot of the places. They won't be able to produce the type of food that they could before these bushfires hit. So we're just not really equipped for it at the moment. What is one triumph or, like, good thing that you've noticed through all of this uh, pandemic spread? That's to try and find, like, a positive is actually really difficult right now because... I've actually been quite disappointed with how, I'm sure not just Australians, but the world has dealt with this. Like, there's just been so much hoarding, so much overbuying, no kind of regard for the people that can't just drive up to the local grocery shop and see what's up there, you know? Like, we have senior citizens and people like that who can't drive anymore, who take an hour and a half bus to find that there's no toilet paper, there's no pasta, there's no tin goods. And it's just sad that we're all just kind of looking after number one and not having any kind of respect or anything for, I don't know, humankind. <laughs> um, but I don't know, the bright side, I don't know, less people are drinking Coronas. <laughs> That's all I can think of. Is there anything specific that you would like to tell people in Sydney or even your neighborhood or, you know, within your grouping? Uh, and then also anything you'd like to say to the world at large? I think the most important thing at the moment is just to be kind to each other. Like everyone's struggling in different ways. And I think it's very easy to just kind of be stressed and think about yourself. But mm -hmm. even just when you're walking on the street and things like that just smile at a stranger like you don't know what like everyone at the moment is going to be going through their own turmoil and their own hardship and sometimes just a good morning or a how are you or a smile if you don't know them you could be grumpy as well but just like make an effort to be kind to people at the moment even in social distancing a smile can go a lot further than six feet yeah exactly and i think as well um worldwide the only thing I could say to people is like reach out especially to the people that you know are alone it can be very difficult to go from working five days a week and being social to just sitting at home on your own so just reach out to people FaceTime Skype text everything and just make sure that the people who are alone aren't too lonely I really appreciate you taking the time it means literally the world bye guys Hi again, everybody. Uh, I actually got some very sad news from Mallory Hagen the day after I had a conversation with her, uh, and she wanted me to give her a call to go over what she's currently going through. So let's give her a call and see what's going on. This morning, I woke up to the news that uh, someone who was a coworker and um, a boss to me in New York when I lived there for all those years. Uh, in the restaurant industry passed away so chef floyd cardos passed away um overnight or i guess early this morning and uh, so many of us that knew him and worked with him just really knew that he he was a different level of human being um sometimes the restaurant industry creates sort of cutthroat personalities yeah. and specifically in the kitchen as i'm sure you recall um and Chef was just always someone who really took the time. Like, he, he really took the time to get to know uh, his employees and, and ask how you were doing. And I'll never forget, when I started working for him, I was simultaneously starting a small business. And 
really using my work in the restaurant to just bolster myself until I could get that small business off the ground. And he asked every day that he saw me, how's it going? Um, you know, it was like, ultimately it was his goal for me to not work there because he knew that that really wasn't what I wanted to do. And so he just offered as much help and, um, guidance as he possibly could. And that's just a rare find, I think anywhere really, but especially in the industry in New York. And so, um, I was really sad to see that news and, um, definitely sad to see so many of my old coworkers sharing it as well. Um, did they say like what? reasoning or what you know thing behind uh covid actually affected him and and caused this death um i to be honest i haven't read i I know that there have been articles i've certainly seen uh things on social media but i don't know the details what i do remember is last week actually he posted on social media he actually posted himself in a hospital gown and said you know sorry to scare everyone i just had been traveling i wasn't feeling well so i went to the hospital just to make sure everything was okay. So I don't really know what transpired over the last seven days, but it does seem to be surreal to to think that he he tried to take the the necessary precautions and tried to uh, do what he needed to do in order to stay healthy, and um, it just didn't come to fruition. And he's relatively young. He's 59 years old. All of this has been very real to me as we spoke about. You know, I, I, I have taken this seriously. It wasn't something that seemed so far away, but definitely uh, waking up to the news that you know someone who's passed uh, and hearing my friends now having conversations about people they know and their family who have it, it's just getting a lot closer to home. Um, and it's it's making this uh, these measures that we're putting in place all the more necessary and hopefully all the more dire for people to pay attention to. No, I totally agree. And I think that you know, looking on a screen and seeing the numbers across the world just growing and growing and growing, it's really a little hard for people in today's society to realize that each one of those numbers is a person. And those people are connected to, you know, an entire family, group of friends, coworkers, everything. And so, you know, just remember whenever you're out there looking at uh, the numbers on screen or hearing the numbers that each one of those numbers is a person. Um, and a ripple effect on communities and societies, right? It's not, it's not one death or, or one incident, but instead of this ripple effect of all of these people who will now be, um, suffering the loss of that person, but it's, it's the loss of productivity, the loss of revenue, the loss of community. Like it's all of these things transpiring at the same time. And to think, that we're in a situation now where these people are passing and they don't get to have funerals. Yeah. They don't, there, are, there is no real closure for their family and for the people that are um, close to them because they can't congregate in the way that they normally would or the way that we traditionally do. So um, it, it's a really bizarre time <laughs> to experience for sure. It is for sure. Well, I just want to thank you for you know letting me know what's go on, going on uh, and I should probably let you go, um, but I really am very sorry for your loss. You know, there are people in the world that touch you even just for like a a small amount of time that really help you become who you are. And I'm really glad that you, you know, knew the chef. Um, Can you say his name one more time? Yeah, Chef Floyd Cardos. Perfect. Okay. Well, I'll let you go and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Mallory.